automatically like your every single time. All right, folks, let's make it happen. Yes, I just want to say How's my location, Bill? How's the volume? Excellent. This is a total placebo, as you probably know. You've been here all day. Hey, everybody. Thanks for coming out. Thanks for all your volunteerism. Thanks for all the time, all the energy, all the advocacy. My name is Brad Rawson. I'm a Somerville resident. I serve as the city's director of transportation and infrastructure. The team that I lead in the mayor's office is responsible for all of the mobility planning in the city of Somerville. Everything from neighborhood walkability to saving the Green Line extension. We are responsible for all of the public space planning in the city of Somerville. Everything from community engagement and preliminary design to financing, politicking, construction management for the city's amazing and yet, uh, as we know from your work, um, uh, relatively deficient network of public space when you look at acreage. We're proud of the parks we have. We know we need to build more. My team's responsibility is to work with you on those issues as well. And actually, again, responding to community advocacy with great leadership from our city council, we have also built a municipal urban forestry program. That is part of the team that I lead in City Hall. Before I stepped into my current role four years ago, I was actually working a job not unlike what Lauren Drago and Melissa Woods had been doing such an able job with, with the Summer Vision renewal process. It gives me great pride to know that, like many of you, I was putting in a great deal of time on Summer Vision from literally 2007, when I joined this great city, to 2012, when our volunteers and our city council board of aldermen at the time uh, ultimately adopted and endorsed Somerville's first ever comprehensive plan. I've been a community planner for 20 years, and I took for granted that not every municipality had a grassroots technical process that resulted in a roadmap for the future. And I was psyched when Mayor Joe asked our staff back in 2007 to launch a community process, ultimately resulting in a comprehensive plan. I was even more psyched when we realized that it's not enough to do it once, that best practice shows you have to update. These are evergreen processes, evergreen policy frameworks. So here we are. Uh, you've been working hard. You've been rolling up your sleeves. We do really appreciate it. Um, the topic at hand that we're going to focus on is on the mobility side of my team's portfolio. Um, so I've got a few slides here. We'll, uh, of course, provide ample time for open discussion. I know that everybody has valuable lived experience. Many of you work in these issues in your day jobs. I see many partners and organizations and entities that we work with every day to try to make sure that the safe, humane, affordable, low carbon ways of getting around this city and the region as a whole are the ones that people, that are actually resonating with people's day-to-day -day experience, right? We can't pretend that any one mobility um, solution works for everybody. We have 80,000 residents that we have to plan for uh, and have to engage in the process. And of course, as we know, we are also at the hub uh, of a regional mobility crisis. So, you know, Mayor Joe loves to talk about the failed policies of the past. Anybody who, like me, has a passion for history knows that we had the better part of you know, 20 rail and trolley stops a, a couple generations ago, and they didn't just disappear by accident. They disappeared as a result of, uh, of intentional public policies. You can make arguments, depending on what documentaries you choose to watch, they were manipulated by private industry to actually discourage people from using walking, bicycling, and transit, and actually forcing them to a, a false choice of buying an automobile or two for every American household. Um, we know that highways were plowed through some of our most vulnerable neighborhoods. We know that our roadways were widened at the expense of our health, our economy, and our social fabric. So it's always fun for me to think about the fact that we are you know, intentionally returning to our roots. It's taken a long time. The reform movement in this great city started 40 years ago. We're now the generation that's taken it uh, into the future. Um, and so when we think about making a community more walkable and bikeable, this is not a revolutionary concept. This is a return to our roots. When we think about getting our residents engaged face to face rather than shaking their fists at each other from behind a plexiglass screen uh, at an automobile moving 30 miles an hour, that's about returning to, to some of the lessons of civics from generations past. I think it's important sometimes to take a step back and realize that things like the Assembly Square Orange Line station, the first one in quarter century to be built, um, wouldn't have happened 
without leadership from Somerville residents, Somerville elected officials, um, and predictable partnership from the private sector. Um, Joe, Mayor Joe likes to tell a story that, you know, MassDOT, God love them, uh, I give them a lot of credit, they're our partner. They didn't want to build the Orange Line Station in Assembly. We had to drag them kicking and screaming, and now it's performing so well. Uh, what an important part of our overall strategy. The Green Line Extension, could have died three times over in just the last decade. I've been a part of the team that has kind of resuscitated this thing from the operating room table a couple of times back in 2011, uh, when Governor Patrick's team uh, recognized that they were too worried about acquiring polluted brownfields in Union Square uh, and jeopardizing their place in the federal funding pipeline. And so the city of Somerville stepped in and helped save it in 2011. And obviously most of us know some of the story from 2015, 2016, 2017. So we can't take for granted that transit extensions just happen. There are a handful of them happening around the country right now. Um, this uh, group in Washington has backed away from certain contracts uh, in red states and blue states. And one of our primary missions right now is to make sure that we don't have to go into kind of the resuscitation mode again with the green line. Until we are boarding those trains, until we are walking and rolling on the community path extension, I'm not going to rest easy, and I hope you won't either. Late 2021 is just a couple of years away, but we got to keep our eyes on the prize and keep working to build the best green line possible uh, and get this thing open for our residents as well as the region as a whole. Um, why does transit work? Uh, why, why, why does our local economy work? Why are our local businesses uh, uniquely positioned? Uh, a lot of it comes back to the fact that, again, we have a history in this community of activism, saving our urban fabric. Go to any American city. You're going to find vast neighborhoods that were hollowed out in the bad old days, the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Yes, I-93 through 10 Hills in East Somerville was a travesty. Yes, the widening of McGrath Highway, demolishing the historic fabric of Brick Bottom was a travesty. But many other metropolitan areas around the country dealt with this in a more uh, large scale and systematic way than Somerville did. We are fortunate to continue to have fine-grained, walkable, human-scale urbanism in just about every one of our neighborhoods. The rail line's tough. We only have so many bridges. I-93 and McGrath are awful, awful barriers to our mobility, to our economy, to our social and environmental health. Um, but Somerville does have these benefits and we want to leverage them, right? Um, and you know, it goes without saying, but again, folks, city government is a lens through which resident participation is focused. We work for you. I'm a resident, I'm a taxpayer. I interpret your mandate as working to make sure our mobility system is as sustainable, as safe, as equitable as possible. And it puts wind in my sails to know that our community demands more quality bike facilities that are not just available for the brave spandex white male crowd. Because again, research shows that when you're asking people to ride in mixed traffic, that's what you get. When you build separated bike lanes, research from around the planet shows that you get more teenagers, more seniors, more women, more people of color. Clearly, we want to design a transportation system that works for everybody. But we've got some stiff, stiff headwinds that we're fighting against right now. This is, again, not unique to Somerville, and it's not unique to greater Boston. Around the country, transit agencies are losing ridership. There are a variety of reasons for this dynamic. Um, everybody always likes to point the finger at the ride-hailing revolution. That is one factor. It's not the dominant factor. It's not the only factor, but, but it's, it's there for sure. Um, Gosh, uh, you know, uh, I was riding the red line downtown for a meeting this morning uh, with counterparts from Cambridge and Boston and one of our regional advocacy groups. And, you know, just thinking about my neighbors, I live uh, in Ward 7 over by Teal Square, and I don't have to ride the red line downtown every day. For all of my neighbors who do, the idea that you would have breakdowns like we had on Monday, 40 minute delays, for my friends and neighbors who live on the east side and decide to ride the orange line outbound to Wellington or further to get an inbound train, I understand why you could be frustrated with our existing transit network and say that it's not meeting your needs. I think the Commonwealth is making important strides. There's an investment program, a couple billion dollars worth of investments in cars, tracks, and signals. They're not going to yield fruit in terms of reliability and mobility improvements for another couple of years. It's 2021 or 2022 before the Orange Line and Red Line modernization programs are completed. They're fully funded, they're underway, they're doing well. So credit where credit's due, but gosh, it's gonna be a hard couple of years. And you know, for, again, for all of our excitement about the Green Line, we got a couple hard years ahead of us on that front as well. Um, I've been living these bridge closures. Uh, tonight, Medford Street closes with the Holmans Building coming down. Uh, from Monday night, the Washington Street Rail Bridge closes. Um, these are real and serious consequences of infrastructure renewal. And to pivot back to that national lens, I know how frustrating this is. 
You all, have, many of you have seen me uh, ad nauseum and probably get tired of my rambles, but you've also heard the more empathetic and kind of, I think, important message from our Mayor Joe, who says, we're sorry, we're sorry, we're empathetic. Construction has impacts, whether it's renewing sewers in Union Square so we can actually flush our toilets and not have the community flood and build in some resilience for the inevitable sea, sea level rise. It stinks during construction. Right, Jessica, you think about all those merchants that you work with every day. Uh, we are truly empathetic and working every day to minimize the disruptions. Um, I mentioned how the uh, bicycle network is better than most peers, but gosh, I was riding a Hubway Blue bike back from my meeting in Cambridge this morning, and I'm like, we got a long way to go before we're Cambridge. Right, right, Lena? Right, Tom? Okay. So um, one thing that we sometimes forget, and I want to emphasize, because a comprehensive plan, when done properly, makes links between different discipline areas. I lead a team of about eight physical planners in the mayor's office. We've got a dozen affordable housing specialists in our same department under the same roof. We've got six or seven small business specialists. Um, and housing influences transportation, as we all know. So since the recession, the greater Boston economy has done pretty darn well, at least for many people. We've added more than 350,000 jobs since that recession, but uh, we've probably only added 100,000 or 80,000 housing units as a region. So the affordability crisis that existed a decade ago when we were working with volunteers and advocates uh, on our original summer vision plan is clearly exacerbated. The drive till you qualify dynamic is real. And think about regular folks, middle class households who would love to enjoy the social vibrancy, the connection to goods and services, the choice to get on transit, to walk or bike for many of their daily and weekly needs. They don't have that choice. They're living in northern Middlesex County, They're living in southern New Hampshire, out in Metro West. And so when we've had this mismatch between job growth and housing growth, all the most progressive Somerville policies in the world can't stop the flood of motor vehicles from overwhelming our neighborhood. All the great reform work that's happening at MassDOT and the MBTA, and it is real. Phil's here representing the MBTA, and Phil, we've been working together a long time. I appreciate all of the collaboration uh, that you have been doing with my team. But even the, the MBTA of the future can't solve this problem, right? So let's keep that in mind throughout this process. Um, what can the city of Somerville control? For me, somebody who kind of has been, I think, almost enamored with the heavy rail and the light rail transit world, somebody who serves as staff person for the amazing Somerville Bike Committee and works with regional advocates, for me, the last couple of years have been all about bus mobility. It has been the underappreciated mode of travel in our community. And you know, I, I know that some of you probably are saying, duh, Brad, we've been talking about this for longer than the 11 years you've been here. So I'm humble about that. But the region as a whole is finally focusing on this issue. And importantly, we're focusing on the fact that the MBTA can't do it alone. We have to help save bus mobility in this region. We cannot achieve our carbon neutrality goals, our social equity goals, without taking courageous stands to speed up MBTA buses. Here are some fun graphics that were in-house generated by our staff. We've got this amazing transportation planner who does some graphic design work. He gets data downloads from Phil and the team over at the MBTA. And what he does with these graphics is essentially model out how long it takes to go half a mile on a typical bus route on some of our major corridors. So um, an able-bodied person walks at about a rate of three feet per second, covers a half mile linear distance in about 10 minutes. And you know, it's no surprise for anybody who rides 86 from Sullivan to, um, uh, to Union that um, bad traffic, you may as well be walking, right? Um, this dynamic, again, is not unique to Somerville or to greater Boston. But one of the solutions that we want you to all roll up your sleeves on and advocate with us is being a city that is courageous enough to dedicate a piece of our local street infrastructure to the low carbon equitable bus mobility form. Um, so let's see where my slides go next. Um, I've got one on, on Prospect Street. Has anybody been following the story of Roslindale and Forest Hills in the city of Boston? Has anybody been following the great successes of the city of Everett and Route 99 Broadway coming down from Sweetser Circle to Sullivan Square? So Somerville um, prides itself on being on the cutting edge. And again, it kind of tickles me to know that my friend, uh, a bit of a mentor, former neighbor, former Somerville resident, Jay Monty, uh, who's the transportation director in the city of Everett, is like the regional rock star because he and his mayor dedicated a lane of travel, and they have sped up uh, the daily trip for 10,000 bus riders on six bus routes 
on Route 99 uh, from downtown Everett to Sullivan Square. So Somerville is now dipping its toe in this water. Prospect Street is our first kind of uh, uh, experiment in this realm. And we'll talk a little bit more about some other projects that we've got in the pipeline here. But just to kind of take that quick step back, reorient us to, to overall mobility ecosystem here, um, folks like Wig and the team at Somerville Transportation Equity Partnership, you know, kind of burned into my mind long ago the idea that I-93 and Mystic Ave, State Route 38 carry roughly 200,000 cars a day, a stunning volume of human beings taking up a stunning amount of publicly owned real estate and generating a stunning amount of environmental pollution that many of our residents, middle class folks, well off folks, and some of our most vulnerable environmental justice populations all deal with those consequences every day up and down the I-93 corridor. Um, how many people does the MBTA transit system move? It's about a million a day. Um, and again, you know, we often think, we often kind of fall in love with our rail transit. Davis is, I think, the second or third busiest red line station in the system. Um, and about, you know, 12, 13,000 people get on every day for a typical weekday. Porter a little bit uh, lower, but, but still really impressive when you look at the overall red line system. Uh, assembly, this is actually some outdated numbers. They're probably closer to three or 4,000 these days, right, Wig? Um, and Sullivan is around 10,000. But the bus routes, the 15 or so bus routes that our residents rely on, they move 15,000 plus people a day. That's incredible. They're on time 60% of the time. How can we ask our residents to build their lives around buses they can't depend on? How can we point the finger at the MBTA and say, you need to hire more drivers, you need to buy more rolling stock. If we're not courageous enough to de dedicate a lane for those buses to move as kind of a, a rapid transit dedicated right of way mode. So um, I think this kind of top line headlines of data are going to be important for the steering committee's work. Now back to our friend, uh, the automobile. Um, traffic stinks. We all know this. And in many places, it's getting worse. Folks probably remember the, uh, uh, the big media splash a week or two ago when Greater Boston received the dubious distinction of having America's worst traffic. Um, and yeah, again, I-93 is awful. Uh, many parts of the Southeast Expressway, the Mass Pike, as well as secondary arterials like parts of McGrath and the Fellsway are awful. But the city of Somerville has been working really intentionally to build a, a database of repeat count locations, engineering grade, reliable information about how many motor vehicles are cluttering up our streets, polluting our air, menacing our residents. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm sorry to sound so bombastic. People need cars to get around. Uh, we are not a car-free community. We are not aspiring to eliminate automobility. We're simply arguing to right-size it and make sure that people who have choices, who are fortunate to have choices for a variety of reasons, take a choice that doesn't involve a 20-foot long by 6-foot wide steel box that moves around at 30 miles an hour and injures and kills people when, they, when, it, when it runs into them. Okay. So in Union Square, we have seen some encouraging news. Some of this stuff is maybe stuff we can take credit for in terms of some of our policy decisions, and some of it uh, may reflect larger you know, economic or, or other travel pattern changes. The cool thing is that we're building a culture of constant measurement that we're investing resources to month by month, quarter by quarter, year by year, keep collecting data at the same locations, understand the variables, the school vacations, the rainy weather, the snowy weather, the Red Sox parades, whatever it is that might influence some of these numbers. It's actually a really fun thing to be involved with. But you know, back to what we can control, I was doing this presentation with the city council a couple nights ago, um, and you know, we just had a horrible traffic fatality out of my neighborhood, and it still causes me to tear up. So. One of the things that we were talking about is that we have made great progress as a community. And for anybody who's new to this community, it's sometimes easy to forget that Bow Street a decade ago was an automobile sewer, 20 foot wide, 22 foot wide, undefined travel lane. Um, it's not as safe or as humane and green as we want it to be today. But gosh, it's better than it was when I moved here in 2007. And I had a nice resident and activist come up to me afterwards and say, I'm glad you showed some of these before and after slides, Brad. Because again, sometimes we take the built environment for granted. I had an East Broadway one that I showed as well. Anybody who doesn't realize how courageous it was for the city of Somerville to eliminate a direction of a lane of travel in each direction on East Broadway so that we could build triple wide and double wide sidewalks, dedicated bike lanes, whew, that's a progressive thing to do. It was wildly controversial back in 2010, 2012, uh, when we were going through that process. So some of these things we can't take credit for. Some of them we can. And I hope that the summer vision process helps propel us into the next series of progressive and courageous decisions. 
<laughs> and ultimately gets us to the vision that we've been working on through our community planning processes. Um, so every neighborhood plan that we have done under George's leadership, this was my role before I stepped in my current role four years ago, working on the first generation of neighborhood plans, Gilman Square, Lowell Street, Ball Square, East Somerville, Union Square, uh, now of course we've done Winter Hill, we're working on Brick Bottom as we speak. Um, it's an exciting time, and in neighborhood after neighborhood, residents and stakeholders articulate a vision of kind of rebalancing that right of way, making sure that, I mean, you know, folks, we got four square miles of land in this city. All of our community goals need to be met within those four square miles. Affordable housing, green space, public facilities and schools, and yes, we need to get around, but one of those square miles is roads. And of that one square mile, only a quarter of it is sidewalks, bike lanes, and crosswalks. Most of it is dedicated to moving automobiles. So it really kind of um, excites me that our residents continue to ask for this next evolution of Bow Street. This is a lot better than this, but we want to propel ourselves into an investment framework that results in you know, Latin American style, European style, shared streets, people focused streets. We don't have to be beholden to automobile culture in this community anymore. And again, this is about us, but it's also about you guys. Um, we have worked with a series of the most progressive planners, community activists, and uh, engineers in the world. Jan Gale from Copenhagen and his firm. Um, this guy, Ian Lockwood, is one of the country's most uh, renowned livable streets professional engineers. He advised the city of Somerville.